My name is Frances Pinter. I'm the chair of the CU Press. I'm also the founder of the press. Now, the press was founded 30 years ago, uh, so we're celebrating our anniversary. And today we're also launching the CEU Review of Books, which is our new pillar, something we're very, very excited about. But um, I want to say something about the history of the press. 30 years ago, the mission was really very straightforward. It was very simple. We wanted to fill the gaps of knowledge about the post-communist countries. And we wanted to give academics from the region a voice to make their scholarships known around the world. Gradually, of course, we broadened the number of authors and sought authors from all over the world. Today, the mission of the press reflects the complexity that we live in, not least the tensions both within and outside of Central and Eastern Europe. Issues such as illiberalism, challenges to democracy, challenges to freedom, that concerns all of us. And we're all in this wonderful central place here in Vienna where ideas of global significance are being discussed, molded, and then resonate globally. We at the press believe passionately that the publication of excellent scholarship continues to be very important in promoting debate. From next year on, we're going to be launching a new series called CEU Press Perspectives. Uh, these will provide new and often unexplored and unusual angles uh, on both the perennial and the new challenges of the day. So I wanted to quote an author that I spoke, that I heard at the Frankfurt Book Fair just last month. That was Salman Rushdie. And he said, I don't like books that tell me what to think. I like books that make me think. And so this evening, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a very exciting presentation which will force all of us to think. I hope you've all picked up the little booklet about the CEU review of books. Uh, the publication itself is online and it's free, as scholarship should be. It's open, and all you have to do is sign up, so please do. And we won't spam you with lots of emails, but you will uh, receive this wonderful publication every so often as it moves forward. Now, there's one person who couldn't be with us this evening, but he sent a message and I'd like to read it out in full. This is a short note from George Soros. So he said, Dear Francis and friends of the CU Press in Vienna, I'm so pleased that the CU Press is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Congratulations. The books it has published over three decades have brought deep insights into the history politics, and culture of the region. And now I have every confidence that the new CEU review of books will be successful with its incisive short reviews, its long reads, and its podcasts. I hope you all have an enjoyable meeting. Evening, rather, he says. It's a meeting and it's an evening, and we do hope it's enjoyable. And he signs it, best wishes, George. Before I hand over to Shalini, I just want to say thank you to a few people. Uh, firstly, the CEU comms department, because they did all the work in getting all of you here, so a big thank you. Uh, to Konstantin uh, 
Iadaki, who is the editor-in-chief of the review, uh, Andrea Talaber, who is the managing editor, and Emily Poznanski, who is the director of the press. You'll meet them and some other members of the press who are all here this evening, and please do talk to them at the reception. So, Shalini, over to you. So good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, space where we've chosen to hold this evening's discussion. Um, let me begin by congratulating Francis, because this is as much a celebration for me of Francis's half a century in publishing as it's a celebration of 30 years of the CU Press. And what I'd like to share with you at the outset is a little story that I know from her of how she came to establish the CU Press, after which she left us in between for a short time, but fortunately, my predecessor, Michael Ignatiev, brought her back in her current role. So the year is 1991. Francis picks up the telephone. At the other end is a man called George Soros, whose name she doesn't recognize. And uh, he wasn't as well known then, or not in the circles in which we move. And uh, he uh, is on the other end of the phone, and he says to Francis, he's setting up a new university, and a university should have a press. And he had gone to the Oxford University Press to ask them how to set up an academic press. And they say, sorry, we are 500 years old. We've forgotten how to set up an academic press from scratch. Whereupon, he decides he's going to ask Francis to do it. She decides she will take the plunge, continue her life in London, and remotely set up the CEU Press for us in Budapest. 1994. This time, she knows who it is who has called her up, George Soros, who says to her, and I quote from this conversation that she related to me verbatim, he says, Francis, wouldn't it be a good idea if we took all the classics of Western social science and humanities and translated them all into all the languages of post-communist countries? <laughs> Well, yes, said Francis. So, Mr. Soros simply asked, can you do it? Francis moved to Budapest, which was the European center then of the Open Society Institute, the OSI, the forerunner of the OSF, the Open Society Foundations, and the rest is history. There is, of course, there are many, many stories that uh, I could um, uh, tell you, but there are other stories we are going to listen to. If we have time, we can come back to the wonderful, it's a delightful story as to how Frances set up Pinter Publishers. She was 23 years old, the first woman to set up a publishing house in United Kingdom, and it was by sheer accident um, a wager which led to the setting up of the publishing house. I'm not going to tell this story now. I'm going to reserve it for Frances to tell you the story herself. It's a wonderful story. But what it's, the evening is going to be is about books. Frances publishing the books, all of us reading books, and our shared love of books and the joys of reading them. So, in one of his best-known short stories, uh, The Library of Babel, the Argentinian writer Borges refers to what he calls a superstition. And I quote, he says, belief in what was termed the bookman. On some shelf, it was argued, there must exist a book that is the cipher and perfect compendium of all other books. And some librarian must have examined that book. End of quote, and his narrator then adds, it's also a quote, I cannot think it unlikely that there is such a total book on some shelf of the universe. I pray to the unknown gods that some man, even a single man, 
tens of centuries ago, has pursued and read that book. If the honor and wisdom and joy of such a reading are not to be my own, then let them be for others. And <clears throat> this is, I think, a good beginning for some of the questions that I want to ask my two distinguished colleagues and friends, Mary Keldor and Michael Ignatieff. Let me introduce both of them very, very briefly for those of you who um, don't know them. Both, of course, are voracious readers. They have come from families in which there were large libraries, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. And what they will share with us is the joy of reading one book each this evening. This has been a very hard choice, so I'm going to ask them to tell us something about why they chose the book they did, and then we'll talk about the book in question. But at the moment, I'm not going to tell you what books those are. Interestingly, Mary and Michael are both distinguished intellectuals, both of them remarkable and prolific writers, but both of them are also uh, what brings them together, in a sense, what they have in common here are two things. One, their books have uncommonly, for academics, reached a very, very large non-academic audience, also in the world of politics and policy. And what unites them is political experience. In Michael's case, the national parliament, and then being leader of the opposition party in Canada. In Mary's case, of grassroots mobilization and political activism all across Europe, and then the last failed activism. There was a lot of successful activism, which we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. But the last failed one, the anti-Brexit movement. Mary is currently distinguished uh, professor. He's a, she's our visiting professor at CEU. She's otherwise professor emeritus. Uh, of Global Governance and Director of the Conflict Research Program at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She's taught at very many um, institutions, but what I think the book that she's chosen, and that's why I do want to talk about just that part of her biography and background, and that is, in the 1980s, Mary was founder of the European Nuclear Disarmament Movement. She was co-chair of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly and People's Europe, and she was a member of the Goldston Commission investigating the Kosovo crisis. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, so this is in fact an interesting coincidence that both of them worked on one commission together. This commission is not going to concern us, but uh, some of the other, Mary's uh, peace activism is, I think, going to concern us when we talk about the book Michael has chosen. So there are reasons for bringing these two strands here together. I'm not going to give you a lot of the book titles, but Mary's published widely both on civil society, which is going to play a role in what I'm going to ask her, as well as on questions of war, uh, on new wars, unwinnable wars, as um, she has called them, and about organized violence in a global era. Michael, as I just said, was my predecessor. He led the Central European University from 2016 to 2021, a very turbulent period in the life of the university, when the university was forced to move out of Budapest <coughs> because of the new uh, law, the Lex CEU, passed by the uh, Orban uh, government. Michael is currently a distinguished professor of history at the university, but before he came to the CEU, he was at the Kennedy School um, in uh, Harvard. As I said, Michael was leader of the Liberal Party in Canada, he was leader of the official opposition, and for many, many years, a prolific broadcaster um, and a columnist, well-known commentator on contemporary issues of democracy, human rights, governance, so there, there is also an interesting overlap with Mary's um, interests. I'm also not going to give you a long list of Michael's books, but mention just the last two, Ordinary Virtues, Moral Order in a Divided World, because I think that has something to do with the book he's chosen for today and his latest book on consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times, and he's moved from consolation to ideas of hope, which I will then ask him about. So, my 
opening reference to Borges' story, The Library of Bible, is not accidental. Both my guests tonight are, they have also one other thing in common. Both come from emigre families. In Mary's case, Hungarian moving to Britain. Michael's case, Russian moving to Canada. So I'm sure the libraries were a bit of the Babelian nature with multilingual collections over generations and books that were either recommended or passed down in the family. And I'm going to ask you to begin your uh, reflections on the joys of reading, thinking back about what kinds of bookshelves do you have in your memory? And what are the kinds of books that you uh, read as uh, uh, children? And my question would be, how many of them uh, would you recommend today as books <laughs> that inspired you? Because I was thinking for myself what I would say to that. So I thought, this is the question I'm going to pose to Mary and to Michael. You want me to start? So, first of all, about books on our shelves. And um, in my case, actually, you said quite rightly that my father was Hungarian, but my mother came from a very cosmopolitan family, too. Uh, they were Austrian, German, Italian, Spanish, French. So she was, even though she liked to say that some of her English relatives had come over, I don't know, in the 15th century. But they were from, oh, Holland as well. So they were from all over Europe. So it was a very cosmopolitan family. And my grandfather, who was a Goldschmidt from Frankfurt, had a bookcase which I inherited which is a beautiful Chippendale bookcase. And in it were all sorts of wonderful books. I just will mention some of them. And first of all, he had, I think he had them printed specially, a complete set of Jane Austen in red and gold leather. And this gives me huge pleasure. I still reread all, I always loved all the Jane Austen novels. I mean, they're really silly romances, but they're also very witty and enjoyable and they're a fantastic read. So I read them over and over again, mainly because the books are so beautiful as well. He also had what was called the Taschen Book of the Frankfurter Juden, which was a complete, I mean, it's still there. It is a complete list of all the Frankfurt Jews and where they lived. And on page 101, I have to remember it so I can show people, he had handwritten how we came in it so I can tell exactly where my Goldschmidt ancestors lived and came from. Um, and uh, so that's, that was wonderful. There were all sorts of other books there. My Italian great-grandfather wrote cookery books and novels, and unfortunately, I don't have the cookery book, but the novels are in the bookcase. So they're those, and they're lots of other books that we have. You were asking me what books had an influence. Well, I mostly read novels and loved them, and I'm a great novel reader. But one book that had an influence is an awful book that I don't, but I think it's important. In fact, funnily enough, I know one of my students is here and I was mentioning it today, but it had a big influence on me. It was called Our Island Story. And it was the history of Britain, starting with the myth of Albion and finishing with 1940 and Churchill saying, oh, and by the way, the whole world being read, and Churchill saying, if the empire lasts for a thousand years, this is our, was our, they will say this was our finest hour. So this book, then there was a new edition of the book I noticed, which said how wonderful we were because we'd given independence. To, but there was this sort of strong, exactly, 
And there was this, even though, of course, my parents were in, that's another bit of a story, we're in India and everything, but nevertheless, that sort of colonial mentality, and also I remember saying to my mother at a very young age, so this was a world war, and it was Britain against Germany, and we won, so we must be <laughs> the world power. And I think that has an enormous influence on your thinking, for bad, but I mean, sort of discovering what was wrong with our island story was a very much a part of my intellectual development. <laughs> well, um, that gets me going too. Um, it, it, just a shout out before I begin um, to Francis, and thank you for everything you've done for the university and for uh, the press and, and uh, Emily. Poznanski, thank you, uh, and all your team, and the CU Press, uh, and the CU Review of Books. I've got a review in it, so you've got to read it. You know, it's pretty, pretty good. And, and it's a great, this is a big moment, that's all I'm trying to say, and, and those who've made it possible should feel very good. Et Monsieur l'Ambassadeur de France, bonsoir. C'est un grand honneur d'avoir votre présence ici. Voilà, there we go. Um, I'm Canadian, I can speak French, so. Uh, and it's wonderful that everybody's here. Now, to the, to the point, it's a good question, and I hope all of you are thinking about your parents' bookshelves and your grandparents' bookshelves, because it is a way of telling the story of your life in a way. I especially like Mary's remark about bad books, because those shelves had some terrible books on them, and it's important to remember how terrible they were. I had a few on mine, including my island story, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, the pits, the pits. Um, but my, uh, my bookshelves would be my grandmother's, on my mother's side, our Scottish Presbyterian schoolmasters and Presbyterian ministers. So. I'm eight years old and I look up to a wall of books and the only book I can remember on that shelf is Motley's History of the Dutch Republic, <laughs> 1875, right? Motley's History of the Dutch Republic is a classic 19th century history of the Dutch struggle for freedom against the Habsburg Catholic occupiers. And so it became a classic text for kind of Protestant nationalism in a way. So it, it is probably a classically terrible book in its attitude towards Catholics, but that's one book I remember on my mother's side because they were Presbyterian ministers and schoolmasters. On the other side, the Ignatius side, the bookshelf is um, my father's books he was born in Petersburg, his native language was Russian, and they were exiled in 1917. And it's significant that in exile, they left with one big steamer trunk. And when you're forced into exile fast, you have to be very smart about what you carry. So they carried jewelry, they carried silver, they carried anything that could be tradable. But, very significantly, they carried books, completely useless, impossible to sell, but they would not give them up. My grandmother, a wonderful woman who I was never lucky enough to know because she died just before I was born, carried with her her whole life a very heavy couple of volumes of Nikolai Karamzin's History of Russia. Anybody who knows the history of Russia knows that he was one of the first great historians of imperial Russia. It's also probably a terrible book in terms of its rationalization of empire. But because she was a direct descendant of Karamzin, she carried that through every nasty two-bedroom flea-bitten apartment that they lived in to the end of her life. So it's a sign of the intense importance of books to comfort you in exile, to remind you of who you were, to remind you what. In terms of, to get back to children's books, um, then I bring in the Canadian side. Um, 
there is an absolutely wonderful, and it's still wonderful, book called Paddle to the Sea, which I first read when I was eight years old. And it's a story of an aboriginal woodcarver who ca carves a canoe, puts it on the top of a mountain, a snowy mountain, on the western end of the Great Lakes are huge bodies of water, and then waits for the spring when it melts and the canoe, the little canoe, s slides down the mountain into Lake Superior, then into Lake Huron, then into the St. Lawrence, and then right out to sea. And you follow page by page as this little wooden carved canoe makes its journey from the mountain to the sea. I can still see every image in that book. And whoever wrote it and illustrated it was a kind of genius. And it told the story of, needless to say, it told the story of my country. And significantly, it told the story and the beginning, the beginner of the story, appropriately, was an aboriginal. So that's a good book, it seems to me. So there we go. There. Let's, let's uh, move on from uh, your childhood to now. I put you on a, a, in a tight spot saying you're only allowed to choose one book. And both of you had a hard time <laughs> choosing one book. And you changed your mind in between uh, many times. So I started reading many books and gave them up in between. Uh, because you changed your mind. Um, and therefore, I think what I do want to, before we get to that one book, which is still a secret, uh, we first need to ask you to say something about why was it so difficult to pick on a book and what are the kinds of criteria that you were using in making that one um, choice, narrowing down your large selection to that one book? Um. Well, we all know why it's difficult. Um, we know it's difficult because we've read some absolutely wonderful books in our lives. And, um, and we also know that we've read thousands of books that were less than wonderful. Um, and, and so choosing the ones that we think we'd want to take with us on a desert island, which is an English trope, you know, or choosing the books that y you would want to make sure your children learn. That begins to kind of be the criteria by which you choose things. My criterion, interestingly, I don't know whether you have this as well, is what book do I want to read to my wife? That is a really tough, that's setting the bar very high. And she's here, so I've got to watch what I say here. She's in the front row. But we've read books to each other for many years, and we've read War and Peace, all 1,200 pages. And we've read Stendhal's La Chartreuse de Parme, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Oui, oui, you know, right? Eh? But, but in a translation. I, <laughs> it's a shame, but it's the best we could do. But and I, I won't go on about all the books we've read. We are currently, and this this is the reason I'm doing this. This is to alert you to the enormous pleasure that awaits you if you read Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey and Emily Wilson's current translation of the Iliad. Two absolutely unbelievably entertaining and wonderful versions of those books. And you then realize that pretty well all of Western European literature begins right there. And so, and it seems ridiculous that I'm this old and had never read the Odyssey and the Iliad until this moment, but I'm now reading them to my wife. So that's why it's difficult, because there's so many wonderful books. And then there are very few of them that you just think are so important that you need to read them to someone you love. So, there we are. Yeah. Gosh. Well, um, I wanted to say... You had quite an odyssey. 
I had a huge odyssey because what I was told, I was not thinking about the main criteria were books that change the way you see the world. And actually, thinking about it a lot, I decided it actually hasn't been books that have changed the way you see the world. It's been conversations I've had with people. And then I went away and read the books because I was having exciting conversations. And so thinking about it, I was thinking about three really important intellectual traditions. And one of them I want particularly to mention because it's also a way of saying something about Francis, which is that I joined something called the Science Policy Research Unit at an early age, and the director of the Science Policy Research Unit was somebody called Chris Freeman, who was one of the people that Francis published. And he was interested in technology and economic history. And that his, their ideas, it there is a whole school of thinking. Their ideas uh, about the idea that capitalism has gone through these phases of what they call techno-economic paradigms uh, has been, to me, really explained economics. I'd studied economics at university in a way because it was about real economics. <laughs> and it explained the crisis we were in. It wasn't explaining it in terms of, I don't know, insufficient demand or excess supply. It was that we'd come to the end of the era of mass production and dependence on oil and it explained all that, and it was about the disjuncture with political institutions. So I wanted to give a book about that. And I could see Charlene thinking that would be just too boring. Can't talk about technology. <laughs> so then the second area, of course. She's very easily bored. You know? Yes. <laughs> and then the second area, which has been hugely important for me, is warfare. I've spent a lot of my life thinking and studying and writing about war. And there were lots of books. Well, actually, I was really influenced by a brilliant French anthropologist who wrote about why it was that the slave-owning societies of West Africa were able to assimilate guns, whereas the hunter-gatherers of East Africa insisted on continuing with their bows and arrows even after guns had been invented. And that was a huge insight. And then I started reading. That was only an article, unfortunately, so I couldn't propose that. But then I started reading about, I read Engels on the theory of force, reading about the social nature of warfare. And so I wanted to have a book by Michael Howard, the British historian on warfare in European history, where he really describes the ways in which each society has its different form of warfare. So that was another area that influenced me, but I won't tell you the third area because that's going to be my book. <laughs> I just want to finish, though, by just adding that I wanted to say it at the beginning. I'm really glad that we're having this occasion uh, to honor Francis because she's been my friend for many years and our lives subtract each other's mm -hmm. at Sprue. And then, oddly enough, we met George Soros at the same time. And the funny thing was, he invited me to lunch to talk about what I was doing in Eastern Europe. And he said, have you got any ideas who could be run the CEU press? <laughs> <laughs> we come full circle. Exactly. And then when I came to LSE, for some reason, Francis was there. I can't remember why. Mm -hmm. And we started this big program of research on global civil society, and Francis helped me. So it's great that we're having this occasion today. So now we're going to reveal secret number one. Oh, mine. Uh, you don't want to... No, I want to start with you because yeah. I have a very interesting link, which if Michael doesn't pick up my cue, then I shall give it to him. <laughs> he may pick it up himself because there's a reason for him to do so. So the book Mary's Chosen is a book that actually many of you, unlike the one Michael has chosen, many of you have read 
and that is Václav Havel's Power of the Powerless. And um, the question that I want to ask you is, number one, could you put the book into two contexts, if you will, for us? One, the context of your own work with um, Central and Eastern European <coughs> dissidents and your political activism, because that book obviously had an effect on how you thought about civil society, about politics, um, etc. But I've often thought the book has been read out of context a lot because people remember who probably read the book later, not when it was written, people remember Havel after 1989. So a lot of people are reading The Power of the Powerless as the book written by the person Havel became, not the person he was when he wrote the book. <laughs> and I think that's an interesting way to think about it. And you reread re the book now, so the third question I would have for you is, what was it like rereading it? Were you disappointed? Or did you say, I did read a really, really good book then? Okay, so let's start with context. So as Shalini said, I was a peace activist in the early 80s. I wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. And I was a bit of the peace act, a bit of the nuclear, anti-nuclear movement that came to the conclusion that the best way to get rid of nuclear weapons would be to end the Cold War. So our goal was to end the Cold War. I worked with an amazing historian, and maybe I should have chosen one of his books, E.P. Thompson, on all of this. And we decided to go to Eastern Europe and try to connect with East European dissidents. And part of it was tactical. Whenever there'd been a peace movement in Western Europe, everyone said it was, they were agents of the Soviet Union. And we wanted to show we were not agents of the Soviet Union. But for me, who was partly Hungarian, my uncle had been a dissident and had been in prison until 56. It was a real meaningful opportunity. And so I, off we went. We came to Eastern Europe. It wasn't easy at first, but we got engaged in a very intense conversation that lasted until 1989. And for me, it was the moment of my intellectual formation. When I met, and I knew all these people really well, when I met people like Michnik, Havel, Conrad, I just felt they were explaining the world, they were putting words to things that I'd been thinking in an incohate way, and really helping me to articulate my politics. And actually, with Havel, in 87, we were all arrested. I went to have a meeting with... Charter 77 in Prague, and we were all arrested and held in a police... We were held in separate police stations, and the Westerners were thrown out of the country. And at that time, we conceived the idea of establishing the Helsinki Citizens' Assembly as a permanent forum for bringing together civil society in difficult places. So it was actually founded by Havel. And although he did change after 89, the one thing he did, he was very committed to this project. So he would invite us to the castle. And he was always asking me, would I, for instance, he asked me to bring together Israelis and Palestinian civil society and have them come to the castle. And what year is this? This, hmm. There was a Labour government, so it must have been the late 90s. And I did invite, and in fact, it, I did invite them all, but then, I don't know, the um, Czech ambassador to Israel, gosh, if I thought I was going to tell the story, I'd have checked the details, said something very <laughs> stupid and anti Palestinian, and the Palestinians then refused to come to Prague. And so we did hold the meeting, but we held it in the British Foreign Office instead. <laughs> but we, it was an amazing meeting, and that we did come up with a sort of, there was temporarily a statement about a two-state solution and a new platform, uh, but of course it didn't last. So, but 
it was not just that. I mean, it was also Yugoslavia, Havel wanted us to bring, which we did. I'm not even sure Ivan in the audience came to one of these. We organized these meetings in the castle of people from all over Yugoslavia. So he did remain committed to see, understanding these things from below that was really important, I think. So now, do you want me to say, or shall we go on to Michael and come back to what the content and no. the relevance to now? Yeah, because and I we, think we come back to another, uh, I, I, I think, depending on, of course, what Michael says, but uh, I think we may come back to some of your work on war uh, uh, with the book. Uh, and actually, there's just one other thing. I wasn't sure, in terms of the actual writings of that period, uh, I wasn't sure whether to choose Havel or not. I mean, I think that Michnik's letters from prison are just wonderful, and I do recommend you to read them, and they are now available, and they're just amazing and very substantial. Um, but it's very long, and I thought, maybe that's too long a book to choose. And the other one, which actually at the time was my favorite, was George Conrad's Anti-Politics, which is, was the most influential book on me. Uh, but it's actually out of print. If you look up on Amazon, you can get one or two second-hand copies, which is terrible. So maybe the CEU should reprint it, because it's a really wonderful book. And it, I always felt Conrad, in a way, was the one who most understood where we were coming from in the West. Michael, what I, I mean, you are free, of course, to say whatever you like on um, what I you just do. heard. <laughs> yes, but I do want to, and this is why I said if you don't pick up that cue, what I found very interesting when Mary chose the book is I went back to the chapter in on consolation. It has an it has a chapter, which is a very moving chapter for me, that you've written on um, Havel's letters to Olga. And of course, you, you have a, a very, very um, uh, incisive discussion also of their relationship, but that's not what I'm going to go into here. Uh, what, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, from uh, what you say there, because I think that leads very nicely into the book that you've chosen. So let me quote um, you first. Václav Havel is most often remembered today for one remark, his answer to a journalist who interviewed him about the wellsprings of his life in uh, 1986, three years before he led his country into freedom. And then this is a quote from Havel. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Now, Michael continues. He says, this remark has taken, uh, often taken on a life of its own and figures to, just one sec, figures to this day in speeches by people who quote it because it inspires them to stick with apparently hopeless causes. <laughs> and uh, this, I thought, is a, a good opening for the book that you've chosen, but you can frame it in any way that you like. Well, I th my book is um, Radical Hope, um, a book by the American philosopher at Chicago called Jonathan Lear, L-E-A-R. And it is a philosopher's reading of a text written by a tribal warrior from mid-19th century American Midwest called Plenty Coops. Plenty Coops was a a uh, warrior who came to maturity in the 1850s and 60s as his whole people faced decimation from smallpox, um, death of the buffalo, invasion of the settlers, and the U.S. cavalry. <clears throat> in other words, there are people 
and this happens to lots of Aboriginal people, who are facing cultural collapse, literally the collapse of their civilization. And it's a memoir by this extraordinary Aboriginal leader who dictated, he didn't, he didn't write English, but he dictated it to a, a friend in the 1930s, basically telling the story of his life. Jonathan Lear is interested in it, and I'm interested in it because it's one of the rare reflections by someone who has lived through the collapse of their civilization. Um, and that has a certain resonance today because it's possible that we face an existential threat as a species either through the collapse of the international order and the outbreak of nuclear war either between China and the United States or between the United States and Iran and we can easily run scenarios of nuclear war and we can also easily run some scenarios of <coughs> environmental disaster and it is a kind of light motif beneath all our problems, we have lots of problems, but beneath our current problems is a sense that for the first time, the future of the planet and the future of our civilization on the planet might be at risk. I don't necessarily want to um, spread alarm, That's, but it is a thought we have, is what I'm, all I'm saying. And if it's a thought we have, then we want to pay attention to a man who had the same experience, who had the actual experience of the collapse of his civilization. And that's, I think, what makes Jonathan Lear's book so interesting, because radical hope is hope when hope is gone. Radical hope is hope against hope. Some of you will know that that's a reference to Nadezhda Mandelstam's fantastic memoir of her attempt to um, fight for the life of and then for the memory of Osip Mandelstam, her husband, who was arrested and imprisoned and finally died in the Gulag in 1938. And Nadezhda Mandelstam wrote a wonderful memoir called Hope Against Hope, which is a play on, the, on her name, which is Nadezhda, which is hope. <clears throat> and there is, so there's a whole genre of books who think about what is it to hope, to have hope, when hope is gone, when hope is, seems impossible. And I think there's a link to Havel in the sense that Havel made that famous remark about hope is not the expectation that something will turn out well, but the sense that you must do something with, whether it turns out well or not. Um, his sense, writing in the 1970s, I think it would be true to say of Czechoslovakia that hope was truly gone the Soviet system seemed permanently entrenched. Um, he was about to do three years in prison. He went to the absolute bottom of itself in prison and somehow found the hope that astoundingly seven years later put him on the balcony in Wenceslas Square in front of a quarter of a million people and he was the president of his country. So <clears throat> there is a, a, a link between Jonathan Lear and Plenty Coops reflecting on how you revive hope when hope is gone and Havel thinking the same thoughts in the 1980s in a different context. And just so we get to the punchline, the astonishing thing about Plenty Coops is Plenty Coops wrote this in 1935, or dictated it in 1935. By that time, against his own expectations, the population of his tribe had rebounded. Um, 
they had successfully secured guarantees for their tribal homeland from the federal government in the United States. They had essentially rebuilt themselves from catastrophe. But Plenty Coops is telling you, when we started in the 1890s, we had no bloody idea at all how we would get back. And so it's a story of rebirth against the odds, against expectations, and is therefore very fascinating, but, and I'll stop soon. The thing about hope that all of these things are saying is that it makes us realize just how peculiar hope is. That is, hope is not rational expectation. Hope is not rational calculation of outcome. Hope is very often hope against hope. Hope in defiance of something. Hope despite something. Uh, you have hope not because of, but despite the situation you're in. And that's what Radical Hope is trying to capture about hope. And that's why I think it's an interesting book and why it has strong connections with Havel. Thank you. So, you may want to pick up, of course, uh, on uh, this particular idea of hopelessness. But I was just thinking, reading the book, because I must admit, I read it because Michael was going to talk about it. I didn't know the book. So I spent uh, last week uh, reading it. Too. <laughs> you too. And one of the things which struck me was, um, this is a Native American uh, culture. He describes the Crow um, culture as a culture of, um, um, of course, it's a very male-centered gaze because um, uh, uh, Plenty Coup is um, uh, a man who's leading uh, the Crow, but it's very much about uh, the formation of a Crow subject, a male subject. It's about courage, but it's also about war. It's about how that whole uh, set of rituals, um, social status, everything is centered around war. So what also, um, uh, it reminds us on the one hand of how central sort of war um, was to certain kinds of cultural practices and of way, the way of defining even a good life mm -hmm. and of being a courageous uh, man, etc. And uh, then, so, so my, I had a very different association from the Havel Association, but Mary can pick and choose whatever she likes. My association was Mary spent decades of her life trying to fight against two things. One, the possibility of a war, and secondly, the vulnerability of all humanity and the destruction of a way of life, which that book addresses so beautifully, but through nuclear <laughs> war. Yeah. So, I, that, so, so I had a very different association, but feel free uh, to choose uh, whatever you like. I had one quote which um, struck with me from the book and um, uh, where he uh, uh, says, the author says, the situation, uh, a culture doesn't tend to train the young to endure its own breakdown. And I thought this is a very interesting idea. He says, a culture does not train the young to endure its own breakdown, and it's fairly easy to see why. A culture embodies a sense of life's possibilities, and it tries to instill that sense in the young. The situation we are dealing with here, however, is the breakdown of a culture's sense of possibility itself. This inability to conceive of its own devastation will tend to be the blind spot of any culture. And I thought, I mean, I'm an anthropologist by training, and I thought, this is a very, very interesting observation into a blind spot of culture. What is the socialization that it does not give you? And what does it mean for us then, as people who face hopelessness, devastation, the threat of a nuclear war, threat of a climate catastrophe? Gosh, there's so much to say. <laughs> so I want to say I want to say a couple of things about Michael's book, and then I want to come back uh, to your question. I mean, a, really, a comment. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed the book, and I, you know, I just feel these insights into American Indians is just fascinating. But first of all, hope. This point you made about hope. So I once asked my uncle, who spent eight years in prison, two years in solitary confinement in Hungary, 
well, how did you survive? What did you do? And he said, I had a motto. Hope doesn't change the future, but it transforms the present. And he said, I always thought I was going to be released from prison and made foreign minister. And so I decided, he, was a, he spoke many languages, so I decided to practice a foreign policy speech in a different language each day. But so I thought, so that was really interesting. So I, I don't know why I'm bringing up my family, because the other thing that interested me is he starts off with this point that Crow tells the story of his youth and his exploits, and then they move into the reservation, and Crow says nothing happened after that. And Lear, and maybe he's right, interprets that as meaning radical hope. I'm not quite sure what it meant. And it had a big resonance for me because my son at the age of 12 interviewed my mother about the war. It was a school project. And I listened to the tape, and at the end of the tape, he said, Granny, why do you say nothing happened? To, nothing happened? Many of your relatives in Europe were killed in the Holocaust. Your brother was killed. My, my un other uncle, my English uncle, uh, was killed in the Battle of Tunis. Why do you say nothing happened? And then she said, but nothing happened to me. And it was sort of, I felt it was survivor's guilt. And I thought there was a huge parallel because she came from this grand Jewish family. Her Austrian relatives, for example, had houses on the ring. They had a castle in Brno. You know, she came from, my father was from a, quite different, ordinary middle-class family, I should add. But, you know, she, this whole existence that she'd lived in before the war was destroyed. Um, but she, she wasn't, an, she was a very optimistic person. She, I mean, I don't think she particularly prized that. She was a committed socialist. Her great goal in life was to make Cambridge, where she lived, labor which she achieved. <laughs> so, you know, so maybe it was radical hope uh, because she sort of was hoping to make the world a better place. I mean, but it was interesting that, that she used the same words. I, I thought, and it, it, that to me was very interesting. And then uh, you were asking about war. Well, this comes back to Havel. Because actually, I think, we were preoccupied with nuclear war. And actually, I think Havel and Conrad were both very conscious of this and felt it was about that too. And Conrad, in his book, calls nuclear war global Auschwitz. And um, Havel talks about the technological civilization, the global technological civilization and the automatism that it's produced so that we are all accomplices in what's happening. We're allowing it to continue and to happen. And he says that that is just as true of the West as it is of the post-totalitarian systems. And I often feel that when people think about Havel now, they think he was just talking about Eastern Europe. And indeed, when I read most commentaries, that's what they say. But I remembered it as something that was very relevant. And I hope I haven't, I was about to run out of, I actually uh, thought I would read you just, uh, um, Uh, it would appear that the traditional parliamentary democracies can offer no fundamental opposition to the automatism of technological civilization and the industrial consumer society, for they too are being dragged helplessly along by it. 
People are manipulated in ways that are infinitely more subtle and refined than the brutal methods used in the post-totalitarian system. But this static complex of rigid, conceptually sloppy, and politically pragmatic mass political parties run by professional apparatuses and releasing the citizen from all forms of concrete and personal responsibility and these complex foci of, well, maybe I won't continue. You've got the point. But uh, I think he really was talking about that. And he, the book is really about a new way of doing politics, which I feel was not only important at the time, was hugely important now. It was about your own personal responsibility, what he called living in truth. And I feel uh, in a world where we have these terrible lies suddenly being normalized in our politics and in the social media, this kind of thinking is hugely important. And I do think, I don't think he thought, any of them thought, that 1989 would happen. I think they thought they were finding a way to live with the communist system and to live with integrity. And they began to think by the late 70s and early 80s that they could create free spaces with their idea, and it would be a sort of slow process of changing personally. I think they never thought it would explode as it did in 1989. Yeah, I, 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 I'd, I'd like that remark of your uncle way back there that hope, what was it, can't... Hope doesn't change the future. But hope doesn't change the future, but it transforms the present and I, I I think there's there's a great deal of <clears throat> there's a great deal of wisdom in that and I think one of the things that Havel I think um, I think discovered in himself when he got out of prison in 1983 is that he could live in truth he could live in hope now he could live as a free person now and that must have been intoxicating and liberating to feel that in the middle of what was still a, a communist society. And that's, I think, a very a genuinely inspiring message that, that, is, that it is possible um, to live not in hope of the future, but to live in hope of the present that is to restore to the present its its possibilities of of living free and living in 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 truth but i i i want i what i like about the, the idea of radical hope is this sense of it being a kind of wager in despite of the odds um, I mean, right now, the the astonishing thing about the where the way we're living now is it's extremely easy for all of us to think to know what we hope for. Two state solution, <laughs> um, energy transition faster, please. Um, an agreement between Russia, China, and the United States to scale back nuclear weapons, an agreement between Iran and the United States or whoever not to go nuclear. I could go on. In other words, <clears throat> there's no shortage of quite clear propositional things we could hope for <laughs> and no bloody way to get there, right? And, and so that then presents an enormous challenge to keep hope alive now. It's not that we don't know what to hope for. We simply don't know how to get there at all. We don't know what agents we could trust to, to, to get there. And part of what made the Jonathan Lear's version of radical hope radical is that 
this tribal chieftain somehow believed, although he couldn't say how, that his people would survive. And there's a, a metaphysical, a spiritual dimension to that, which is extremely important. Um, my take on that is, as a historian, is that if you contrast hope and despair, despair is the belief that the past is utterly useless. That is, there is nothing in the past that can give us any grounds for hope. That is, despair is a rupture in the unity of time in some way. And the thing about this tribal chieftain is that he still feels, despite the collapse of everything he can hold on to, that the spirits are still alive in the world and that his traditions can still tell him how he should live now, even if they can't tell him how to get to tomorrow. So what sustains his hope is a sense of the deep, of, of an enduring continuity of time that cannot be broken and that that's the source of his hope. And I think that's extremely important because I think at the moment, the common parlance is there's a caesure in time. Time is, time is broken down. All the continuities that we've had through our lifetimes, and I'm now in my 70s, have broken apart. And I think that's the source of despair. And I think it's, in my view, it's wrong. Um, there's plenty about the journey we've been on so far that can give us hope in the present. It just can't predict the future. I'm going to close the discussion on uh, a quotation from the book, uh, Radical Hope, because I think that's a, a good way to bring some of the uh, things both of you have just said uh, together. Uh, so I quote Jonathan Lear, he says, precisely because Plentiku, this is the name of the chieftain, precisely because Plentiku sees that a traditional way of life is coming to an end, he's in a position to embrace a peculiar form of hopefulness. It is basically the hope for revival, for coming back to life in a form that is not yet intelligible. Mm. Commitment to this possibility in no way commits one to the idea that the world is the expression of a theodicy, nor does it commit one to the wildly politically incorrect view that Western civilization is a higher form. I would like to consider hope as it might arise at one of the limits of human existence. What makes this hope radical is that it's directed towards a future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. Radical hope anticipates a good for which those who have the hope as yet lack the appropriate concepts with which to understand it. What would it be for such a hope to be justified? And I thought that's such a brilliant mm. observation. Uh, on this whole theme. So if I may be allowed to end on this note and thank both of you, Mary and Michael, uh, for this wonderful conversation and Francis and Emily for the opportunity to be sitting here moderating it. All that I now want to do is to invite you to a glass of wine and some finger food waiting for us outside and then we can continue the conversation on whatever joys of reading and books that you would like to discuss with one another. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.